Well, good morning, everyone. It's already a little past, and so we want to jump in as quick as we can. Matthew chapter 14, if you have your Bibles open there. Matthew chapter 14. Of course, we're studying the life of Christ, and as we move along, and we're in the Galilean ministry uh, of Jesus Christ and focused there at this time, and as you see on Lesson 9, we're covering and focusing on the death of John the Baptist, the miracle of the feeding of the 5,000, Jesus walking on water, and some very controversial teachings of Christ in John 6, at least the audience and many of his disciples found it controversial. But uh, Matthew 14 and Mark 6, if you can grab both of those, um, that would be good. Does anyone need a question sheet? If you don't have a question sheet, raise your hand. We have extra copies and we'll bring that to you. Do you, do you have Lesson 9? Well, as we, again, return our focus on the life of Christ um, on, the, on Sunday morning in the adult class, let's be reminded and catch up on some things regarding our map. Of course, Jesus was born in what town? town of Bethlehem, this was according to whose prophecy? I gave you an easy one, now I'll give you a little more challenging one. Who prophesied Jesus would be born, the Christ would be born in Bethlehem? Someone contemporary with Isaiah, Micah, Micah chapter 5 verse 2, we read about it in Matthew chapter 2, when the wise men came, saw the star from the east, came looking for the king of the Jews to worship him, Herod the great called in his, the scribes and, and asked them, where is the Christ to be born? They got it right. They quoted from Micah 5 and verse 2. And when you go back and look at that prophecy, it speaks of his goings forth are from everlasting, which speaks of his deity. And, of course, though he was born in Bethlehem, uh, remember they briefly had to flee down here to Egypt as Herod sought to kill uh, the baby Jesus. Eventually, they return to Galilee, and uh, Jesus grows up where? Remember Nazareth. We just studied last uh, Sunday how he was uh, rejected uh, in Nazareth because they were so familiar with him, um, and so he didn't perform many mighty works there in his hometown of Nazareth where he grew up as a carpenter. But now he has his three-year earthly ministry leading up to the time of the cross. Um, important body of water, Sea of Galilee, um, not a large body of water. Um, I had the privilege and blessing of going over to what's called the Bible Lands, the Holy Lands years ago, and when we were driving up toward the Sea of Galilee, it was a clear day, and you could see from one side of it to the other, but many of Jesus' miracles took place around this area, of, of Galilee. By the way, when he was rejected at Nazareth, his new kind of home base became Capernaum. Okay, remember his first uh, miracle was where? That's right. And there's Cana of Galilee. Even going back to an earlier study, um, Samaria, when most Jews would go around it, Jesus passed through it in John chapter 4, as we studied, came to Sychar of Samaria, where he taught the Samaritan woman at Jacob's well, and not only her, but remember the whole town basically uh, came to believe that he is, was the, is the Messiah, the Christ, uh, the Son of God. Okay, but right now we're in the Galilean ministry, and so we're up in this area. Occasionally he crossed over to the uh, east side of the uh, Sea of Galilee or the Jordan River that goes up through here but primarily he's, he's in all that orange area. Okay. In fact, while I'm thinking about it, when we come to John 6, uh, if you don't pay close attention, you could miss that much of the, many of those controversial teachings of Christ, uh, he was in a synagogue, it says, in Capernaum when he taught those things. So keep that in mind, if you will. Okay. So Matthew chapter 14, Mark chapter 6, also referenced Luke chapter 9, verse 8 with question 1. But why would Herod think that Jesus was John the Baptist? 
what had happened to John by this point in time, because this is kind of looking back and catching the reader up. John is dead, right, at this time. He's, he's been put to death. Uh, so the events we read about it, it's, it's going back and kind of filling the reader in on what had already occurred. Now, it's Luke's account at the end of Luke chapter 3 where we read that uh, John had rebuked Herod for many of his evils. Specifically, it brought up his unlawful marriage and that John was put in prison. We just studied uh, last week uh, in Matthew chapter 11, when John was in prison and he sent two of his disciples to ask Jesus, are you the coming one or do we look for another? Remember that? And so there in Matthew 11, he's alive in prison at that time. But by the time we come three chapters later, he has already been put to death. So John has been killed by Herod. Jesus, of course, has been more and more on the rise uh, with his teachings, with his miracles, and everything that's being said about him, his fame and popularity is, is, is spreading. Why would Herod think, though, that Jesus was John the Baptist? He says that in verse 2. Uh, he said to his servants, this is John the Baptist. He is risen from the dead, and therefore these powers are at work in him. Think about that. I hope you did. Because here's, here's one thing. We know John didn't perform any signs during his, his life, his earthly ministry, right? But Jesus is. John? Okay. Okay, I think that's a good, good response, good answers. Uh, ignorance, uh, certainly Herod had that as many of the Jews did, Herod and the Herods being uh, Edomites, but uh, a fear factor as well perhaps as he knew he put a just and holy man to death uh, and he shouldn't have. Um, and maybe thinks this is John. Another reason is Jesus and John, were they, were they teaching and preaching different messages? Competing messages? No. Remember? The, main, the core of their messages were, was the same. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And, and Jesus is teaching and preaching that, but he's also performing miracles. And maybe John's risen back up preaching that message, but now he's performing miracles and has that power because he's come back from the dead. And God has given him that power. Uh, perhaps that's why he thinks that. Any other thoughts on that? Okay. And what were others thinking about Jesus at this time as well? It's kind of reminiscent of a text we'll look at soon in Matthew 16 when Jesus asked his disciples, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? Uh, go ahead, Norm. Yeah, I think to some degree the Elijah thought and theory or thinking that may be Jesus may be Elijah is somewhat understandable because the Old Testament closes by just saying in, in Malachi chapter 4 verse 5, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children, the hearts of the children to the fathers, lest I come and strike the earth with a curse. Of course, I was talking about John. But it just says, I'm going to send you Elijah the prophet. Boom. And what happened to Elijah? Well, he was taken up in a whirlwind and a chariot of fire. And the way he left, so maybe God's going to send him back to earth. And that's what it says. So it wasn't, and even the disciples, the apostles themselves needed help with who the Elijah was, right? Uh, Matthew 17, Mount of Transfiguration, around that period of time, Jesus just comes out and says it. And we studied this earlier in Matthew 11. He had already said it back 
In Matthew 11, when he's uh, expounding about John and what do you think about John and who he was or who he is, Jesus comes out, and if you're willing to accept it, he's the Elijah to come. Um, and so that's already been, been said. But So that's one thing. Some are saying, well, maybe Elijah the prophet, uh, maybe um, he's like one of the prophets, or one of the old prophets had risen again, is what we have uh, in Luke 9 and verse 8. Uh, and maybe it's the prophet. You know, the, so the Jewish expectation, anticipation of the Messiah coming, the Christ coming, or Elijah coming based on some Old Testament prophecies. Deuteronomy 18, remember God had said to Moses, I will raise up a prophet like unto you, and all the people shall hear him. If they don't, they'll be put to death. Of course, Peter quotes from that prophecy when we get to Acts and Acts chapter 3. Um, but uh, so you can, you can understand and appreciate there's that anticipation, excitement when John comes on the scene and now Jesus comes on the scene even more so with the signs and miracles and wonders, who could this be? But many are not at the point yet to say this is the Christ, the Son of the living God. All right. Number two, what are the reasons for why John was put to death by Herod? When you look at the text of Matthew uh, 14 along with Mark chapter 6. Okay. Okay, exactly. Now if we back up from there, Herod and Herodias kind of had a personal vendetta against John, right? Because of his preaching against them. They took it very personal. And it was personal in the sense that in their situation, they didn't have a right to be married. And John addressed that. Uh, he didn't ignore that. Uh, John rebuked Herod and Herodias. It's not lawful for you to have your brother Philip's wife. And that, in particular, is why he even imprisoned John. Now, Matthew's presentation speaks of how Herod wanted to put him to death, but he feared the multitude because they perceived John to be a prophet. Well, if he really feared the multitude, why did he arrest him? But he was holding back on, on killing him. Now, Mark presents it a little bit differently, or maybe some more, I say differently, some more details, slanted more that Herodias in particular was really kind of chomping at the bit, I want to kill this man, uh, more so than Herod. Because uh, if you go to Mark 6, and if you're not there, go to Mark 6, please. And after it speaks of how John had condemned their unlawful marriage, verse 19, therefore Herodias held it against him, and wanted to kill him, but she could not. Why? For John, for Herod feared John, knowing what? That he was a just and holy man, and he protected him. And when he heard him, he did many things and heard him gladly. That's a, that's a different kind of take then from reading Matthew verses Mark 6. Like, well, okay. I'm sure still it upset Herod, but he's got to the point now that he's been in prison. He would hear John on different occasions, enjoy hearing him and conversing with him. And he was protecting him in a sense, holding Herodias back. But what's the very next verse say? Then an opportune day came. And this leads up to what Shirley was talking about. Opportune day, his birthday and the celebration of it. Okay, so there's a number of factors when I ask this question, what are the reasons? There's not just one reason. There's different factors that, that come into to leading up to John being put to death. So first of all, both Herod and Herodias, Herodias in particular, wanted to kill him for condemning their unlawful marriage. Number two, going to what uh, Sister Shirley said, uh, the daughter of Herodias, which we know from history was a woman named Salome, she danced in a way that pleased the king to such a degree, and you don't, don't, maybe not use imagination too much, but we can, okay, how is she dressed? <laughs> how is she moving around? 
to get a man who's married to this girl's mother to say, I'll give you anything you want up to half of my kingdom from her just dancing. You understand what I'm getting at? Uh, a carnal dance, a fleshly dance, a very worldly, I mean, these are worldly people, and they're having a party, and maybe a very seductive manner, but it got him to the point where he's like, hey, anything you want, up to half my kingdom, I'm going to give it to you, just over a dance? Yeah. Um, here's a worldly-minded, <laughs> lustful man. That's right, that's right. So, uh, because then we have uh, this, this uh, rash oath uh, that he, he swears, and that's another part of it. Uh, now she goes to Salome, the daughter goes to Mama, Herodias, and Herodias, she pounces without any hesitation. When she's like, what should I ask? It wasn't, well, let me give it some thought here. No, she just, she, she immediately comes out with that vitriol and bitterness and hatred that she's had in her heart and, and against John, and immediately says, ask for, for John's head on a platter. And uh, that's what she does. Herod is greatly displeased with this. This was not, nothing that he thought in his mind <laughs> at this moment of great weakness on his part that that's what was going to be requested, or he wouldn't have, I'm sure, made the offer. And the text says, because the oath that he had sworn, and those who sat with him, with the king, and heard it, kind of, kind of save face type thing, he felt like he could not refuse her, and so he did. And he sent for John to be executed and beheaded, and his head was brought on a platter. Obviously, this affected our Lord greatly. Um, the love he had for, for John, this righteous man. They were related, remember, Mary and Elizabeth. Uh, so John and Jesus were related. But he said, of women, there's none been born greater than John the Baptist. And so... He withdrew for a while, Jesus did, after he heard this by himself. But he didn't have long because the multitudes are always clamoring for his attention. Um, number three, the feeding of the 5,000. Interesting, it's the only miracle recorded in all four Gospels. You know, John's Gospel in particular stands so unique in many aspects com in comparison to Matthew, Mark, and Luke, which those three are, are oftentimes referred to as the synoptic Gospels, meaning sing together, a lot of similarities. But in this, this one miracle, you can find it in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and in John. Now, it, it's, it's really nice and helpful because you can study all four and pick up some uh, new and, and, and additional information. So we do that here with Luke briefly. Uh, Luke 9, verse 11, what does Jesus do or what did Jesus do prior to the miraculous feeding? Okay. That's right. He spoke to them about the kingdom of God and he healed those who had need of healing, right? So, you know, in the other text, you might say, well, a bunch of people and he just fed them. It's good to be reminded what Jesus' main focus is, if we needed that reminder, and that was to come and seek and save the lost. He came to preach. And the greatest preacher, of course, ever that, that ever walked this earth. And so he's preaching uh, to them about the kingdom of God. And, and, of course, in his mercy and compassion, he continues to heal. And letter B under number three, what was Jesus doing when he instructed his disciples to give thousands of people something to eat and why? Because he told them, you give them something to eat. Okay. Um, Jesus, uh, as we just studied last week, I believe it was, um, the limited commission. You remember he sent them out and he gave them power authority to perform miracles and healings and cast out unclean spirits, but to, uh, as a test, and I think this was a test, and I think he was always challenging their faith and the depth of their faith. 
and particularly their, the depth of their faith in Him. Uh, you're going to say something similar to that, Norm? Okay. Um, and so, yeah, challenging tests in their faith. Their faith and trust in Him needed to grow. And grow in what way? Who He is. Ultimately, that He is the Christ, the Son of the living God. And we're not far off from them coming to that conclusion. Um, how did the multitude respond after witnessing this miracle, the feeding of 5,000? By the way, 5,000 5, who? Men. Not, not including the women, not including the children. Uh, Brother Waldron, Sister Waldron, and sir, we would see Jesus, says it could have easily been 10,000 more or more. And yeah, you got the wives of these men there, and then they have families, you got children. No, the men are just 5,000. I don't think that's a stretch at all to say that he, this could be 10,000, 10,000 plus that were fed uh, with just a few fish and uh, loaves as we read in these uh, four gospel accounts. So, uh, when, and, and John's account in particular, by the way, backing up a little bit when he's, he told uh, the, the, the people uh, to, that or told his disciples about feeding them. Notice Jesus, um, he said to Philip in John 6 and verse 5, Where shall we buy bread that these may eat? And, but this he said to test him. He's not just testing Philip, he's testing all of his disciples, for he, he himself knew what he would do. And Philip answered him, 200 denarii worth of bread is not sufficient for them, that every one of them may have a little. And one of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, There's a lad here who has five barley loaves and two small fish. But what are they among so many people? If you think about this, this mass of people looking out and just imagine around 10,000. And you have five barley loaves and two small fish. I mean, most and not all of us could put away two small fish by ourselves, right? And maybe one of those five barley loaves, and not more if you're a bread person, okay? But thousands and thousands and thousands of people. And Jesus says, have them sit down. And so they sat down, and he gave thanks. And they, the food just kept breaking off miraculously in his hand, given to the disciples. The disciples distributed. And only that did he feed perhaps around... 10,000 or so. But then there were leftovers after everyone had their fill, right? Um, 12 baskets of fragments. More at the end than at the beginning. What a miracle. So, at the conclusion of this miracle, getting back to my question, how did the multitude respond? Well, in verse 14, in John 6, they said what? Yeah, this is truly the prophet. I think the prophet. I think this is Deuteronomy 18 reference uh, prophet, not just a prophet. Uh, but this is truly the prophet who is to come into the world because God, through Moses, said he would raise up a prophet like unto me. Well, what kind of prophet was Moses? A lawgiver. He was a lawgiver. A prophet like unto me. Uh, Jesus was a lawgiver, the New Testament, but uh, of course, but that seems to be uh, that reference, that messianic reference. And then when you look to verse 15, what was the response of some? Among these thousands, evidently there were many who were, uh, were about to come and take him by force, the text says, and make him king. And right on the heels of that, Letter D, how does John 6, 15 and John 18, 36 through 37 answer the error of premillennialism that Jesus will establish an earthly kingdom? Well, you remember Herodias saw an opportune time. If Jesus was looking for an opportune time, this was it. This is really, and, and the Waldrons again point this out, but this is at this point in time in his Galilean ministry, this is at the zenith of his popularity. And the people are ready to come and by force, if necessary, make him king. This is our man to be king of the Jews, finally. He's here. 
And when Jesus knows that, perceives that, what does he do? I'm ready. Let's do this. No. Immediately departs by himself to the mountain. No. Didn't come for that. Later when he stands before Pontius Pilate, are you a king then? Rightly you say so. He said, for this reason I was born. But I was born, he says, to bear witness to the truth. And right above that he says, my kingdom is what? My kingdom is not of this world. Well, right then that tells us, yes, I'm a king, and yes, I have a kingdom, but it's not earthly. It's spiritual. It's heavenly, right? It's not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight for me, so I wouldn't be delivered to you. But my kingdom is not from here. That's pretty specific, and that's pretty plain, isn't it? Okay, and this kingdom, of course, that he and John previously had been preaching about, John previously, Jesus still and his disciples, is at this point at hand. It's near, but it's not from here. Spiritual nature, right? And that alone, even though there's many other passages that answer it, here these two passages very effectively answer that. So. In fact, um, you know, it's, we're out in the, the wilderness. How are we going to, where are we going to get this food? And we don't have the money. But yeah, you have that many people, that many witnesses, eyewitnesses to the miracle. It kind of reminds me, uh, Seth and everyone, of what we have later about what Paul wrote about the resurrection of Christ in 1 Corinthians 15, over 500, most of which he says are still alive to this day. You can go check, that's, that's a whole lot of eyewitnesses to seeing the risen Savior, to be convinced uh, the t tomb is empty for a reason, and it wasn't because the disciples stole the body or some other hoax. He, 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 he rose from the dead. Now, we, we do have sorcerers who were deceived by medicinal ways, but it's hard to fake being filled with food. You can't, you can be faked into thinking you saw something, but it's hard to fake that I ate. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Good point. All right. Appreciate it. Anyone else? Go ahead, Tristan. Naturally, no, supernaturally is the only explanation, right? Yeah, great point. Okay, appreciate that. So number four, what three miracles took place on the Sea of Galilee as we look at Matthew 14, 22 through 33 and the text in John 6, 16 through 21. You might think of one, there's really three here. There might be short of one, actually. Yeah, might be short of one, <laughs> as I'm, I'm focused on three in there. Um, uh, let's see, let me look at John 6 real quick. So, you have the sea, then the sea arose because a great wind was blowing. So, whether it was a storm like the time when he was asleep, and the water's coming in the boat, and we're perishing, we're about to die. I don't know if it's that, but conditions could change just like that on the Sea of Galilee because of the geography around that sea. 
Um, but that's another thing, right? John 6, 21 is, is unique in that when they re willingly received Jesus in the boat, they Im and immediately the boat was at the land where they were going. Okay. Um, yeah, John is unique in that way in, in, in his description of uh, Jesus when he got in the boat. They're at, immediately at where they were intending to go in, uh, at land. Um, I'm looking back at some of the, the others real quick. Um, so is that the four you were talking about, Norm? Right, <laughs> miraculous transportation, uh, being right where they were, were headed. Um, go ahead. So Matthew, in his account, Matthew 14, is it Matthew 14, right? Yeah. Uh, says that the wind stopped, and that's verse, you got it? Verse 32, and when they got in the boat, which would be Peter and Jesus, the wind ceased. And then we also have in, in this account, then those who were in the boat came and worshipped him. Um, and saying, truly, you are the Son of God. Um, all right. All right, we're going to move on time-wise. What caused Peter to sink in the water? What does the text say? Well, seeing, it says, seeing the wind was boisterous, he became afraid. And Jesus asked him what question there in Matthew's account? Why, oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? Because Jesus, uh, Peter is also walking on top of the water without sinking briefly until he kind of takes his focus off Jesus and what's going on around him and he lets that overwhelm him and he becomes afraid and he begins to doubt and he has a weakness of faith. Not that he has no faith and he doesn't believe in Jesus, not that he's not, not to be a follower of Jesus, but his faith is not strong yet. It needs more growth, and it will grow. But uh, when you have fear, when you have doubt, you're going to have a little, little faith. It's going to affect your faith. Um, and what sort of effect do doubts have upon a Christian's faith? Well, we just mentioned it, Matthew 14, 31, it weakens our faith. And then when you look at Matthew 21, 20 through 22, and 1 Timothy 2, 8, and James 1, 5 through 6, similar text because it's dealing with prayer, right? And uh, we will not receive our prayer request if we doubt, if we doubt. Um, and James hits that real hard uh, about, let not that man suppose he will receive anything. He's like a what? A wave of the sea tossed to and fro. Uh, double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. So here I'm asking something for God, making a request in prayer, but I'm doubting the reception, receiving of that as I'm asking. That's a double-minded man. I'm not going to receive anything if that's what's going on. Or I'm just wasting uh, my time and, uh, and what I'm, I'm voicing uh, to God. And then the Luke 24 text dealing with when Jesus had risen from the dead, he asked, why do doubts arise in your hearts? And he encouraged them to handle him and know that it was indeed uh, their Savior and the Son of God. But doubts must be removed from you and from me if we have them. All right.
And all things you ask in prayer, believing, you will receive. Mm -hmm. So that believing is a requirement as well, according to Jesus. Exactly. So in verse 21, I surely I say to you, if you have faith, there's believing, and do not doubt. So the doubt has to be removed, as we're saying. You have to have faith, and that's the believing, that confidence, that trust in God and who we're praying to, who we're asking. Uh, but that doubt just, it chips away, and it, it makes that prayer and those requests ineffective. And Peter's not praying here, but there's still the doubt. He says, oh, you have little faith. Why did you doubt? Why did you doubt? We should never have any doubts when it comes to Christ and the, the Word of Christ and the promises of God. Uh, number five, why did the people seek Jesus? What should they lay before? And how is this similar to what we see in the religious world today? See, that's three questions in one. Sneaky, huh? All right, um, so what, why did the people seek Jesus? This is falling the next day after the feeding, uh, miraculous feeding. I mean, he calls them out. They don't, they don't say this. He calls them out. You don't, you don't seek me because you witnessed the sign, the miracle, but because you ate loaves and were filled. You, you, you want another free meal, handout. Uh, sounds kind of similar uh, to some things we hear and see today. Um, and what should they labor for? Jesus said, labor for what food? The food which endures to everlasting life, the food that only he can give. As Peter would later say, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life, right? Um, and, of course, churches, so many churches today appeal to the world on a very carnal, fleshly basis, and many seek after those sort of things. So churches are making those kind of carnal appeals, and many people are, are drawn by that, and they, they look for a, a church in, with those kind of motives, sadly, instead of a hunger and thirst uh, for righteousness. All right. Um, number six, what did Jesus identify as a work of God in John 6, 28, 29? Because they ask him, um, what shall we do that we may work the works of God? So he tells them, here's a work. What is it? Believing in Christ, the one whom the God sent, right? Believing in the one whom the Father had sent. Now, how does that truth run contrary to what many teach today regarding salvation? Many churches today teach what? Yeah, they, they, they preach against doing any kind of works because they have a misunderstanding so many of the different works the Bible speaks of. But Jesus is talking about the works of God. And when we teach and preach works, we need to be, of course, teaching and preaching consistently. We need to do what God says. That's what His works. And uh, exactly right, John, they say only believe, faith only, and yet Jesus identifies belief in Him as a, as a work of God. Belief in Him is a work of God. Uh, Ephesians 2.10, we were created in Christ Jesus for good works that God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. In Colossians 2.11-12, the big one that, of course, they really speak against baptism is referred to as the working of God. One of my favorite passages and, and dealing with that, Colossians 2, 11 and 12, because it just comes out and calls baptism. Yeah, how do you explain it? Our sins being washed away if it's not the working of God when that happens, right? Number seven, what did Jesus teach that caused the Jews to complain and many of his disciples to walk with him no more? And I'm going to highlight these real quick because uh, we do not have much time. I am the bread of life, which came down from heaven, verse 41. They were offended by that. Verse 41 says the Jews complained about him because he said that. And then in verse 40, uh, 51 and 52, The bread that I shall give is my flesh, which I shall give for the life of the world. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life. Verse 54. Um, so what was the meaning behind those, the Lord's quote-unquote offensive statements? Well, one must partake and receive of the benefits of Jesus' redemptive sacrifice and to have eternal life, and of course, feed on and obey His words. Uh, who comes to Jesus according to John 6, 44 and 45, and why should all come to Him? Those whom the Father draws. If you look back at verse 44 and 45, and who, how does the Father draw, by the way? So a lot of denominational folks will jump on this. 
if you keep reading it, Jesus says, everyone who has heard and learned, and he also speaks of being taught from the Father, that's the one who comes to Jesus. That sounds kind of like Romans 10, 17. So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Yeah, the Father draws, but how does he draw? How are we called, 2 Thessalonians 2, 15, uh, 2 14, we're called by the gospel, right? And why should all come to him? As Peter says, Lord, to whom shall we go? We have come to believe, you have the words of eternal life, uh, and we have come to believe what? That you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. All right. Thank you for being here. Thank you for your comments. And uh, we'll continue our studies in the life of Christ next Sunday. If you haven't picked up the question sheets, Lesson 10, they're in the back. Also, they were emailed out.